Apple Bay or Life on the Planet by Paul Williams. Copyright Paul Williams, 1976. Part 2. Chapter 11. First, I'd better go back and explain how this whole thing started. Carol Ann and I left California in early April, 1970. We moved into the cabin in the woods at Apple Bay in late May. Between times, we stayed mostly in Bent, a fishing village that marks the end of the coastal highway that runs nonstop from Mexico to Canada, 2,000 miles. Bent, British Columbia, Canada, is the end of the road. Apple Bay is 12 miles farther north. You have to thumb down a boat to get there. There were five people living in Apple Bay when we arrived. Stan and Lulu lived in the A-frame by the water. Most of the ground in the garden had been dug up. There was still hoeing to be done. Some of the seeds were in. Others were ready to be planted. Tomatoes and grass plants growing in the cold frames. The summer was quiet. Not many visitors the first few months. I spent a lot of time alone, jigging for cod, reading science fiction books and nature books. Quiet summer. Cherries in July, visitors in August, new arrivals, Rebecca, Hank, and Dennis. We are growing enough food to feed five or six if all goes well through the winter. When nine or ten? Stan and I argue. I favor more of an open admissions policy, trusting that the life is demanding enough to weed out those who contribute little, forgetting in my enthusiasm how little I contribute myself. Stan sends out cold vibes, but he won't actually tell our guests to leave, so the tribe increases. Hank was staying on the farm in Bent when I met him in June. At the time, he seemed on the verge of being asked to leave, and I suggested he come and see us if times got tough. There was a strong optimism, a determined craziness to him that made him seem natural for Apple Bay. He showed up in late August with Dennis and Quetzalcoatl, a square-rigged lifeboat with a steel hull in tow, which ended up capsizing in no time anyway. September brought Carl and Judy, and then the rest of the crew from the interior, Steve, Sam, Jan, and Tom. Jean didn't arrive till October. Our population was now 14. Stan decided to dig it. We took acid together, made music, went on sailing expeditions, started building a communal kitchen. Lulu split, and Annie arrived. Changes came thick and fast. We started seeing a lot of each other. Harvest came, and where there had been little food for seven people, we lived exclusively on flour, molasses, oats, potatoes, rice, greens, cherries, and goat's milk. There was now an abundance of food and smoke for 14. And November came, and the rains at last, and one fine day I walked into Hank's teepee and grabbed him and started yelling and shaking his shoulders, and Hank, who was on acid, beat the shit out of me and broke my glasses, and then neither of us knew what to do except hate each other and mistrust the people around us. And then Rebecca said she didn't want to have her baby at Apple Bay. <sighs> How do you tell a story? Where do you start? How do you keep it from getting too complicated? I guess it's not easy if you want to sound objective and all you really want to know about is yourself and you're afraid to face what you know about yourself. That's me. I came to Apple Bay in May of 1970. Before that, I lived in Mendocino County, Northern California. I moved there from New York City in October of 1968 and spent the next six months alternately living alone in the woods and traveling about the countryside. This is really around the time I started waking up. I paid the rent, my housemate Alan caught dinner, and welfare and unemployment checks augmented our diet, unfortunately. Andy, a friend of mine from back then, got us Mendocino folks into grains and health foods from the city. We traded fish for vegetables. Things got crowded and confused and more wonderful every moment. It was paradise but for this unbearable bursting feeling, and we started talking about going to Canada. I met Carol Ann at a rock concert in Cali, and we sort of stuck, and the two of us headed eventually for Vancouver together. I remember it took a week to get across the United States border, and after further misadventures on both sides of the border, we went on north toward our destination, slightly paranoid but determined as ever. When we got to Bent, Road's End, we learned that a young man had just drowned at Apple Bay. At the farm in Bent was a letter from Stan, addressed to Dear Mendocino People. A few of us from Mendocino, Californian crazies, were talking with the folks up here about coming up, and apparently some ugliness had occurred somewhere along the line before we arrived. 
The letter said there were nine people at Apple Bay. The community was just getting together and was still quite fragile and couldn't really accept an influx of newcomers, okay? Signed, Apple Bay people. Okay. We settled into the farm at Bent. Went back to Vancouver to get supplies, dug up the ground for the garden, extended the picket fence, planted the garden with Bruce and Catherine and Guy and Madeline and a handful of new arrivals from our old stomping grounds in California. Sometimes it felt like home. Most times, it felt like a confused bunch of loners who would never get it together. I went to Apple Bay to get my mail sometime in the middle of May. There were five people there. Stan was glad to see me, made me feel very welcome, showed me a cabin Carol Ann and I could live in, and a week later, there we were, living in Apple Bay. Chapter 12 Autumn The water grew cold. I stopped swimming. Entering the ocean first thing every morning had been the one constant in my life at Apple Bay. It had given structure to my days. Now winter came and took this away from me, took away my proud bare feet, took away my contact with the water and the ground. People came. The community grew. Claude and Andre and Therese left. Carol Ann wanted me and her to move in the house on the hill. I resisted. I loved that cabin in the woods. I loved the smallness of it, the privacy, the distance from the rest of the community, the nearness to forest and ocean. It seemed a perfect location. To Carol Ann, it was dark and lonely. I offered to put in another window. Finally, I agreed to move to the house on the hill, but only on the conditions that I was not leaving the cabin in the woods. My idea was this. There were now new people coming to Apple Bay. Sam and Rebecca and Tom from Salmon Arm and Rebecca's friend Mary, whom I had fallen in love with when she visited us in the summer. The housing situation was, from left to right, as you stand in the ocean, all Apple Bay cabins are near the water, though often hidden by trees. One, the cabin in the woods, furthest cabin, not actually on the surveyed property, a squatter's hideout, built in 1969 by Elaine and Louise. Walk along the path five minutes or so, and you come to number two, the house on the hill. Harold's huge, by Apple Bay standards, two-story creation, built 1968. Then you walk downhill toward the garden. You pass, number three, a small cabin off to your right, overlooking the ocean, originally a goat shed, built 1968 to 1969. At the bottom of the hill, the path forks. You can walk by the well to the orchard and garden, or follow the water and come to, number four, the A-frame. The A-frame was built by Carl, probably in 1968. It looks out over the little bay where our boats are anchored, an extension of the big bay. Walking on from the A-frame, we arrive at 5, the cabin by the water, now called the communal kitchen or the galley. From the galley, you can walk upslope to the garden, or across slope by the water, to the shop and storage shed, where we store our junk and do any indoors tool work. Then up to Le Pisserie, the food storehouse. At times, Apple Bay has been 90% French-speaking. And then on through the trees to number six, the little cabin built in 1969 and shaped weird, like a T. Rebecca, who was four months pregnant by either me or Sam, when she moved to Apple Bay in August, lived in the little cabin. My idea was that one person could live in the cabin in the woods, one in the former goat shed overlooking the sea, and several, three or four, in the house on the hill. With a certain flexibility, meaning sometimes I could live alone in the cabin in the woods, sometimes someone else could, whoever needed to get away for a while. In other words, five people, Sam, Tom, Mary, Carol Ann, and me, it seemed at the time, spread out over three cabins. The one in the goat shed could eat at the house on the hill, and probably everyone would end up hanging out there. Big, easy to heat, nice view and the cabin in the woods would serve as a hermit's quarters or whatever for whoever needed it at any given time. Details to be worked out day to day, month to month, as necessary. I mean, I, I told Carol Ann, I don't want to leave the house in the woods unless it's to do something more, some sort of personal expansion, a more difficult and possibly more rewarding trip. Carol Ann readily agreed, particularly since she too was attracted to lovely Mary. But Mary never returned to Apple Bay. Chapter 13. This is a book about life on the planet. I'm on the planet. I don't know how I got here. Things swirled around. I went to California in December and didn't return to Apple Bay until February. When I got back, I couldn't find a place to live. 
My little cabin in the woods had been taken over by a newcomer named Don. The floor of Stan's cabin was cold and unbearably lonely in those nights when Stan and Carol Ann were sleeping upstairs. All other possibilities, including the floor in the shop and the table in the storehouse, were already taken, and I ended up in the galley. The galley is a good place to crash. Stan had built a fine sleeping loft under the eaves while I was away, but a lousy place to live. The galley is the hangout, especially in wintertime when the stoves are always going, and people arrive there early in the morning. Some cabins aren't fit for making breakfast in, and they leave late at night. I grew quite desperate for a bed to call my own, and that's really the long and short of it. I'd really wanted, ever since September, to live with a small group of people in the Hill House, but it just wasn't happening. Sex, territory, restlessness, stubborn egotism, the need for privacy, the need for togetherness, need for moral leadership, it all adds up to ceaseless pain, an end to dreams, and someday, some days, the beginning of the real work, order out of chaos, the hardest job any of us has even imagined ever facing. We've got to build a home for ourselves on this godforsaken planet. And if we don't want to live alone, we've got to learn to live with each other. It's simple, isn't it? And we're all so sincere, too. Sometimes I just feel like crying. But I know what the work is now, and I'm just about ready to get back to it. Not that I ever left it for even one moment, or ever even could. That's just where this book begins, isn't it? I love you, whoever you are. This is the start of Book 2 of Apple Bay. Chapter 14 I guess it's not over. It's never really the end. What can I give you that will give you pleasure? What can I give you that will give you me? I used to live at Apple Bay. I'm confused about what was once so clear. Who are the good guys? What's worth fighting for? Which side am I on? I discovered I'm not so great as I thought I was. I guess that's not so unusual a discovery. I realize this book started out in paradise, and now it's at the bottom of the soul's dark night. Only not so dark now, starting the ascent again. By God, the deepest valleys are summits to me now, and the path goes on from here. Truly amazed. I used to think of Apple Bay, before I even got there, as the place where I would make my stand. In Mendocino, I got religion. The Redwoods gave me the word. The hole that was left in me after reading Dune was filled with purpose. I would save the fucking planet. I would fight the lumber company, the land developer, the highway, the chainsaw. But the odds were too great in Mendocino. I was too weak, and my friends too uncertain, and the powers that be too strong. I had to go somewhere where the land would make demands on me, where the supermarket would be unreachable, where our side, the land, could stand a fighting chance in a fair fight. There would be nowhere left to flee, and I would have to turn and face the pursuer. I went north. I fled. I moved to Apple Bay. And I learned to live without money, sort of. I learned to grow food and walk and swim and row and fish and learn how to sharpen a cross-cut saw and eat a rutabaga. I learned to cook and work and eat and sleep and be satisfied. And I learned to hate and learn to fail and learn to be unsatisfied and uncertain and unreachable and undone. And I faced the pursuer. Or, or did I? Oh, I remember. I'm beginning to face the pursuer. Beginning to turn and fight and go on with it. That's what I'm doing now. Look at the hero, folks. I am the enemy. I am the traitor. I have sworn allegiance to the pen and the tree. I am the force that cuts and the force that plants. I am the barefoot boy on the forest floor, sitting in socks in a Vancouver hotel, sneering in the mirror. Truly amazed. I guess it's not over. Chapter 15, A Chronology October 1968, I left New York City and moved into a cabin in the Redwoods near the coastal town of Mendocino. August 1969, met Carol Ann at the Woodstock Music Festival. We drive back to California. December 1969, northern scouting trip, visit Apple Bay. April of 1970, Carol Ann and I moved back to Bent, British Columbia, Canada. May 1970. Move into Cabin in the Woods at Apple Bay. August and September of 1970. Apple Bay population explodes from 7 to 15. November 1970. Fight with Hank. December 1970. Rebecca's baby born. Fight with Carol Ann. I split to California. 
February of 1971, return to Apple Bay. April 1971, leave Apple Bay again, train to New York City. Chapter 16. Somewhere I got the idea that people are supposed to live together. When I moved to Mendocino at the end of 68, I moved there alone. My best friend had just died, my woman had left me, and I had abandoned my community, a group of intense young people locked together in the adventure of putting out a magazine, because I could no longer bear the responsibilities of being the boss and running the business. Finally, after three years, I was starting to die, and I decided, if this thing can go on without me, okay. If not, okay, <laughs> goodbye. And moved to the woods alone, just as I'd started the magazine alone. No one wanted to go with me. And then after a solo winter, friends come in in the spring. Because there's room, you know? It all starts with the housing shortage. Community starts with the housing shortage. Or with the lack of something to do. And more friends come because it's so good and getting better. And there's still room. And we always feel like it'd be nice to be together. Here's our chance. Me traveling a lot and enjoying the place tremendously when I'm around. Still sleeping alone. Then I go to Woodstock and bring back Carol Ann. And already I'm thinking about heading north. The deal to buy the Mendocino land fell through, and anyway, with all this energy, we need greater challenges. I have a lot of ideas about ecology by this time, and we need to grow our own food, not suck off the welfare state and the supermarket, we need a place to be alone with each other, and some sort of village community without the constant pressure of outside reality. The media, the city, money, and all that. Nature turns out to be such a good trip. Let's go all the way with this natural trip. Let's go to the wilderness. And anyway, something inside me realizes it's a good way to escape from this fucking Mendocino. It's too social. It's going to get me. Let me out of here. I'm always trying to escape from situations I've created. And always trying to look for a truth I can't escape from. I play with myself, and the rules are rigorous. The game always blows up in the end, but those moments or years when I totally believe in and know the rightness of what I'm doing, and so I have no choice but to work my ass off for the cause... Those ecstatic, fulfilling hours make it all worthwhile. I'd rather be crazy than disillusioned. Somewhere, I got the idea that people are supposed to live together. I guess the occasional family sense of in Mendocino really turned me on, and Mel Lindman's essay on community. I've always been one to try to push things to their absolutes, so if you believe in ecology, you have to try to stop doing anything that harms the environment in any way whatsoever, direct or indirect. And if community is the ideal and the outside world the problem, then we have to go where the outside world can't reach us at all. Lock ourselves on an island and slug it out. Let's force ourselves to enter the age of Aquarius. I envision this huge village community of hundreds of people, well spread out, way the hell off some ford somewhere. All we need is a big piece of land. The vision's so powerful, the money will surely come of itself. Blah, blah, blah. But it felt real true at the time, and anyway, when it turned out that there was nothing really holding us together, no land available, just another talky dream, people fell away, and Carol Ann and I moved north alone. I could dig that, too. I saw how what we couldn't do consciously would grow in time, unconsciously, if indeed it was meant to be. Hundreds of people spread out over these wild forest waterways, arriving separately, growing separately, but growing together. The environment, sameness of place, will unite us, or else it won't. We'll, you know, we'll see in good time. And at any rate, I personally had talked too much to turn back now. I convinced myself, and my lady was with me. North we went, knowing nothing of living in the new world. Chapter 17 I could tell you some stories about boats. One time, we left Bent in the Bounty. Bounty is a double-masted catch rig. Remember, 30 beautiful feet of real wooden sailboat. We set off from Bent, Carl and Judy and Carol Ann and I, and at that time we were trying to get beyond the engine. Bounty's got a fine diesel motor. Get ourselves free of the machine altogether. Anyway, this fine day we decided that waiting for the wind was the way to live. Who cares if we take a week to get home? It's 12 miles. We pushed off from the dock with the gaff, that pointy pole, and sort of rowed our way out to the breakwater. With full sail up, jib, main, and mizzen, we were scarcely moving, just a windless September day, and night soon fell on the water. Carl tied the sheet to the rudder, and we all went to sleep, sails still flying, hoping that by morning we might reach Parsley Island, a port of call scarcely two miles from Bent. That night, I woke up, sleeping on deck, in the middle of the night, 
and his impossible realization came over me, I went to get Carl. Hey, man, wake up. We'd run aground, now this is amazing, on the only sandy beach anywhere in these waters. Any other island would have sunk us for sure. Apparently we were leaning against a boulder. The tide was going out, and soon the, we knew that the boat would fall over. Ugh, all those sacks of grain on deck. Is this to be the end of the bounty's career? Nothing to do but get ourselves to shore. I felt strange lowering myself into the water. Must be shallow or we wouldn't be stuck, but it's the ocean at night, a hundred feet from dry land I'm dropping into. We carried our clothes and our sleeping bags over our heads, praying the tide wouldn't go out any farther. Nothing to do but huddle on shore and enjoy the moonlight. We all made love to each other, each to each, so easy, relaxed and happy all wonderful night. Words unspoken, so close, the four of us. And then the tide went out, and incredible sight. The bounty lay naked and dry on the shore, completely out of water and still okay against a rock. But when the tide comes in again... But she survived that too. Never fell, floated nicely as the water came up. Carl stood vigil on the boat, awaiting the fall that never came. He went back to the bounty after his crew fell asleep, then motored to the Parsley Island dock, and I guess we sailed home, but I can't really remember. You can't get there from here without a boat. Chapter 18 my memory is spotty. I remember moments. I don't always remember the order they happened in. I remember making love to people better than I remember talking to them. I remember people coming and going, August and September, touching me in different ways. Harvest is such a time of bursting. I remember picking apples. I remember dancing, feasting, and smoking dope. Flirting with Judy on Redonda Island, Stan on acid in the wind. One day we all ate together in the orchard, made music and slept there and stayed the next day, getting fruit from the trees and potatoes from the garden, never going back to our separate cabins. Three days running, laughing, drumming, energy rising so high it almost engulfed us. We scattered, but I think our separate lives were not quite enough after that. We tasted ecstasy. We wanted more. Hank got his teepee up. We built the galley. When I first met Hank, his name was Michael. He was living in a teepee in a commune near Mendocino. Then we met again in July at the farm in Bent. Michael was pals with Guy, a beautiful, enthusiastic, 19-year-old French-Canadian Aquarius lad. I hit it off with Michael, or Hank, right away because he had a spirit, a kind of mad optimism and determination. I dug he was a brother. I also dug he was not fully appreciated at the farm. His energy was a little too real for a community of strangers already at the ragged edge of their idealism. I told him he should come and see us at Apple Bay if things got weird. Six weeks later, there he was, Hank, from Henry, the name of Dennis's dead brother, whose ID never did come in the mail, with new buddy Dennis. Stan didn't say they could stay. I didn't say they couldn't. They left and came back and left and came back again. Eventually, they became fixtures. Two great men. Hank a Gemini, Dennis a Sagittarian. Apple Bay won't settle for anything less than greatness. And greatness is madness. Maybe that's why I yelled at Hank and Dennis when they were off to the city one day. Their lack of discipline in the face of restlessness threatened me. Felt like a ripoff of the family's energy for them to leave all the time, evading the working it out between us that was trying to happen. Great workers are always great shirkers. And I must have wanted to run to the city myself. It's a trip, living in a place you can't walk away from. Hank brought back a squaw one time. That's what he called her. Her name was Annie. She was married to a wealthy young man in the city. Hank not only grabbed the guy's wife, but his boat as well. A 14-foot, clinker-built lifeboat, later christened the Sister Kate. Annie was a prize. I wasted no time before courting her favor. She liked me, too. Chapter 19. Now they say hippie communes are wild woolly hotbeds of sexual freedom, and I've always been in favor of any kind of freedom that would give me a richer sex life. When Hank arrived with Annie, Carol Ann and Carl and Judy and I were all sleeping together every night in the hill house. Then Hank and Annie started sleeping up there too, and then I made love to Annie, and that was the end of it. Hank didn't say anything, but Carol Ann freaked. Carl and Judy went back to the A-frame. Carl doesn't like it when things get complicated. Hank and Annie moved it to the teepee, and I went back to the house in the woods. Carol Ann got mad at me because I was treating her like shit. 
and I was treating her like shit because I didn't know what else to do, or maybe I didn't care. I don't know. Telling this story is bringing me face to face with a lot of blocks in my memory, simple things that I just can't remember, things I obviously don't want to remember. I remember Annie and I kind of fell together, and I remember fighting with Carol Ann sometime later that day, and I remember Carol Ann turned to Stan, unburdened her heart to him, and he in turn talked to me, asking why I was treating her so, or was it true or something? I think that made me angry, at Carol Ann, not Stan. Ugh, writing this story is killing me. Carol Ann and Stan became friends that day. I mean, this story is being told entirely through my eyes, remember? All these people are, in a real sense, figments of my imagination. I never put Carol Ann and Stan together in my mind before. They belong together, though, just as Carol Ann and I do. I can't and won't deny that. I remember I gave Carol Ann the treatment because, ah, she asked for it. Anyone fool enough to live with me is asking for it. And bless you, dear, my dear friends, for your folly. I'm sitting here wishing I could remember all the things that Carol Ann had said to me that I didn't want to hear. What did she yell at me that day Annie and I made love? Something about how I was treating her like a machine. Oh, Carol Ann, I'm afraid of you. You've really got a hold on me. Let me go, and I'll run after you and court you and love you till you grab hold again. Anything you run after runs away from you. And with that bad news, I think I'll end this chapter. Chapter 20 Oh, Lord. Carol Ann and I drifted apart. She and Stan got together, and I got to be alone, or at least go on my own trip for a while. There were some weeks there where Carol Ann would sleep with Stan at his house on the bluffs one night, and stay with me in the cabin in the woods the next, effectively spanning the spiritual and geographical extremes of Apple Bay. Which is just what I'd wanted, or demanded, I think. I don't know. Stan and I became friends. We'd been sizing each other up for six months. Annie and I became lovers, sneaking off occasionally, suddenly catching each other's eyes outside the galley to spend some sweet moments together. Judy and I... Ugh, oh, Judy. Judy and Carl arrived at Apple Bay in early September on the Bounty. Carl had left Apple Bay, his home on and off for the last ten years, in March, after returning there from Mendocino and doing his best to arbitrate the struggle between Harold and Stan, a classic Apple Bay power struggle which Harold eventually lost. Carl sailed the bounty to Sointula in March, eager to escape the never-ending pressures of proprietary responsibility. Carl's father holds the title to the land. Carl, for years after his parents left, was the only person at Apple Bay with the stature and courage to finally say, okay, you, get out of here, and, you know, get results. Carl went to Sointula, a small Finnish settlement on a northern island, lived on the bounty in the breakwater there, and soon met Judy, a sad-eyed, spunky, beautiful New York Jewess, a humble refugee from the wars of love, recently arrived in Sointula from Montreal. Judy and Carl fell in love. Oh, marriage made in heaven, so fine for a while just messing around in boats. Judy loves water and danger and exhilaration. Women all envy her endurance and fearlessness. Men adore her for her beauty, the spirit in her face. Carl is a born leader, and all creatures know it. Women see his goodness, and men aspire to his energy. And Carl wouldn't mind if you'd follow by finishing or helping with the project he started. But it took me a long time to discover that I'm not Carl, and I shouldn't try to be him and accept that he will not and cannot tell me what to do. Oh, marriage made in heaven, why are you so difficult to consummate here on earth? And Judy in tears, unshed, washing dishes, making candles, spinning wool, baking gingerbread, canning pear sauce, climbing fir trees, carrying pickets, planting cabbages, Carl working happily, carving oars, splitting rails, repairing a rowboat, picking apples, looking around for the right thing to do right now, and always finding something new. Then after dinner, it's bedtime again, and nothing's ever quite simple. Often it's easiest to sleep alone. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm telling you the truth as it seemed to me just the other day. Judy and Carl together again after a year apart a year apart in the same place, both at Apple Bay, but still not together in the way I can't help knowing they both want to be. And where do I fit into this? Only in that I was foolishly, romantically in love with Judy, and am and always will be, probably from the first hour she arrived. She and Carl took off their clothes and dived into the ocean. Oh, how beautiful we are, how beautiful we are. <sighs> I would like to apologize to my friends for eulogizing them in general misuse. 
I'm helplessly bound to spread the word that there are great spirits abroad on the land. The people I know are the greatest men and women who have ever walked on earth, and why not? They're the same ones as ever. All the energy that ever was is here, right now, and in my fingertips. I know you don't want to be great or special, but I must sell you down the river anyway. You got no choice. Greatness belongs to the people, and if you don't like it, you can always kick them in the teeth. Of course, you never asked to be great in the first place, but that's the price you pay for taking on difficult tasks. <sighs> never mind. It, it makes no difference anyway. Just keep making those candles, love. I, I want to see your face at night. Chapter 21. There's work to be done. That awareness is unavoidable most of the time in Apple Bay, which is one reason we all find it difficult to live there. It's also one of the great attractions of the place. Thank God for work that's right in front of us, something to do that's immediate and satisfying and engages the body and spirit as well as mind. My body goes crazy in the city, though my mind just dribbles on and on. Mind is a tyrant. Mind cares for nothing for the needs of spirit, the needs of body, the needs of heart. Mind is on a power trip. Mind must be kept in its place. People with ordered, repetitive lives sometimes let their minds grow soft. We who live by our wits have other problems. We let our bodies soften and we let our hearts grow hard. Hearts got to be open for life to flow. Care of the heart is part of the work to be done. I came to hate Hank because I liked him so much and couldn't tell him so. I couldn't get to him, and all the while his cries for help were growing louder, his fits of rage against the community, the women in particular, more violent, more effective in the sense of getting to people, causing an upset. It was driving me crazy. What's happening, man? Let's talk about it. I want to be your friend. Don't tell me nothing's happening. Everything's groovy. Your silent fury is driving me bananas. Let me in, you son of a bitch. Let me in. It was the famous day Hank went into the galley and threw all the dishes, pots, pans, drums, books, tools, everything out the door, onto the ground, into the sea, because it was too messy in there. And it was. When there's disharmony in the community, there's always a stinking mess in the kitchen. Tension knots the stomach every time. And Hank loves order. His way of creating it is to smash disorder. Then it works. Stan and Carl did a lot of work on the galley. It's always under construction, after Hank cleared the way. Hank didn't. He, he couldn't. Too much emotional turmoil. What wasn't immediately needed to make supper stayed outside in the wet for days, maybe weeks. The ladies were angry. Hank, I think, was reaching out. He was desperate to let people know how he felt. That's just a theory, I guess, but it comes from pretty deep inside me. Hank and I have a lot in common. There's more Gemini in me than I care to admit. When Hank came to Apple Bay, he was with Dennis. Then Hank and Rebecca got together and were extremely close for about a month. Dennis was in the city a lot, working a fish boat in the mouth of the Fraser River. Hank was cutting teepee poles, young cedar trees, carefully selecting each tree from a different place in the woods, cutting one of two trees growing too close together, paying attention. Hank's presence in Rebecca's house at that time is burned in my mind as the image of a dozen 20-foot poles leaning against the roof of that little cabin. The ground was thick with cedar shavings. Rebecca and Hank broke up and didn't even look at each other anymore. Hank's teepee canvas arrived from California. Everybody slept in the teepee now and then and loved it. Gotta keep low when it's smoky, but there's no more harmonious structure existent. And Hank in the teepee was the perfect host. A lot of great things happened sitting around that fire. And oh, Annie came and that was fine. Hank and Dennis and Annie, Gemini and two Sagittarians, lived together well for a while. Nothing is forever at Apple Bay but the ocean and the mountains. But Hank, well, he reminds me of me. When he has it together, he's the king of the mountain. And when he doesn't, he's the most restless, ordinary, insecure bastard in creation. Annie left Hank. He was turning into another husband, and she just escaped from that. She moved out of the teepee and stopped being his squaw. It was early November. Annie decided to go back east to visit her parents. But first, she moved in with me. Chapter 22 Annie and I spent maybe four or five days completely together, completely alone, and it was terrific. Out in the cabin in the woods, we were, we were like two kids. I told her long, involved stories about my life, and she made me feel like she was really with me, enthusiastically taking in stuff I'd been needing to share with somebody for a long, long time. We just really relaxed, made good love, and maybe it was only for three or four days. One morning, a boat was going to bent, and before I could say, hey, you know, don't you think it's a little soon? You've only been in Apple Bay a month. I'm afraid you'll never come back to us. 
She was gone, 3,000 miles back east to Ithaca, New York, in middle-class background, promising to return by December 1st. More about Hank. He was raised in a Catholic orphanage in Cicero, Illinois. Went to vocational school, went to jail, went to fight in Vietnam. School of hard knocks. Hank's tough, came back from Vietnam, started selling dope and living in a teepee, traveling around with his teepee pole strapped to the top of his van. Came out west and ended up in a hippie commune way back in the woods south of Mendocino, a strong idealistic farm community started by survivors of the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury scene. Split for the North Country only a few months after Carol Ann and I did, and found himself at Apple Bay. But Apple Bay disappointed Hank. It lacked the order of places he'd lived in in the past. What he really wanted to do was find his place in the scheme of things and just slide right into it. But at Apple Bay, you have to make your place. You got all the power in the world to change things and nothing to lean on but your inner resources. There's no scheme of things. Apple Bay shrugs off weak people and destroys strong ones. It destroyed Hank and it destroyed me. We had a hand in each other's destruction, though. Chapter 23. Beef Fat. At Apple Bay, we use as little money as possible, partly because we never have any, partly because we got something to prove. We're trying to prove you can stay alive without being the unconscious instrument of your own destruction. We'd rather face the wrath of the ocean than feel responsible for the fumes of the pulp mill. It's a proud trip, and maybe a doomed one, but in a good cause, there are no failures. We're here to turn the world around. God damn it, you gotta do what you feel. But fat's a problem. You gotta have a certain bit of fat and oil in your diet, just like protein and carbohydrates. And our grains, greens, and an occasional fish diet has hardly any fat in it at all. Oysters are quite fatty, but when you have a million oysters, you'd be surprised how seldom you really feel like eating some. Once a week is plenty. Besides, what are you gonna fry your potatoes in? So we usually end up buying vegetable oil, expensive stuff, and almost always highly processed. Anyway, we do it just like we buy rice and wheat, in bulk. But at the time of this story, we were trying something else. A bunch of us got infatuated with the idea of beef fat. Carl started it, I guess. He's always been into free meat as a good hit, like hard cider and coffee. The point being that when you're trying to bypass money, living on garbage is an honorable, ecologically sound way of getting what you can't grow or hunt yourself. Our food gathering and growing efforts are closely defined by the limits of our environment. Once upon a time, the Indians in our water got oil, for lamps as well as cooking, from the ulachin or candlefish, a wonderfully fatty creature you could reportedly just run a wick through and light up, now completely fished out of these waters by the white man. You just can't live like the Indians did. The land's been pulled right out from underneath us. So Carl went into the supermarket and asked for and was given maybe a hundred pounds of beef trimmings, fat the butchers cut off before offering the meat for sale. And what you do with this stuff is you render it, cut it up in chunks and warm it in a fry pan till it becomes liquid, don't let it overheat, and carefully pour off the liquid into canning jars. It's good to put a fork in the jar to conduct heat, keeps the glass from cracking, and then render some more. End result is many jars of clear liquid become white, solid beef fat, good for baking, frying at low heat, making candles and soap, and a big stack of beef rinds, fat crunchies we call them, good for the dogs, good for people too if you're not thoroughly sick of meat after two days pungent rendering. This fat keeps real well, and it's free for the labor. But meat, well, everybody knows that at rural communes, meat's more controversial than sex. Hank didn't like the smell of the beef fat. While it was being rendered, he just stayed clear of the galley, but it had bothered him on the boat with Carl coming back from town. He later said that he came very close to throwing the stuff overboard, and then also every day when he visited the galley and there were still boxes of unrendered beef fat around. He sincerely believed we were poisoning him with rotten fat. It was no use trying to tell him that what smelled was the little bits of meat still sticking to the fat, which get fed to the dogs once the stuff is rendered anyway. Beef fat just gave Hank the creeps, and he was in a mood to be at odds with everyone anyway. Hank at that time was an annoying presence in my life. About a week earlier, I'd gotten fed up with the chronically insufficient supply of stove wood in the galley. When there's not enough wood, all the indoor projects, cooking, canning, making candles, blah blah blah, it all becomes twice as time consuming and frustrating. No one feels like doing anything, the galley gets cold and uncomfortable, but everyone needs something to do. It contributes to the general malaise, and there certainly was a general malaise at that time. 
I'd found a pile of fairly dry fir logs in a section of the woods where Carl had done a lot of thinning six years earlier. During a stint of forestry enthusiasm, he had cut down every superfluous tree in a tight stand of second-growth fir. I like to get a routine going. Steady work, high productivity. I had a sawhorse out there, and Gene would cut off rounds in the morning. He had just recently arrived at Apple Bay and recovered enough from the loss of his spleen to saw some wood. And I would come by in the afternoon and maybe cut off some more rounds, chop the rounds into thin, useful fir sticks, and cart the wood by wheelbarrow loads to the galley. We were at least a week ahead after a couple days and gaining quickly. Then Hank and Dennis came back from one of their endless expeditions to Bent or Vancouver, and they didn't have any wood to burn in the teepee. So they took the rounds Gene and I had cut for galley wood and chopped them up for their own use. It was a small thing, and it wouldn't have offended no one if we were all feeling good toward each other, but that was not the case, and I was, I was just pissed off. When it happened a second time, I was righteously angry, eager for a confrontation, but I, I calmed down poured my energy into chopping wood, and discovered they'd actually cut the rounds themselves the second time, and I let it pass. But a lot of the stuff like this was happening. And then, I walked into the galley with an armload of wood, and somebody told me Hank had a bonfire on the beach in front of the galley, I'd noticed it vaguely, and was burning the rest of the unrendered beef fat. I was annoyed, Hank's a persistent gadfly. I could see his point, nobody had rendered any fat for three or four days, and it did smell. Why not just put the stuff in a shed and at least save it for dog food? Anyway, I'd just been thinking for several days I would take some of the fat out to my cabin, where I was spending a lot of time those days. The galley was a drag, nobody was happy, and Rebecca in particular was a constant uptight presence. So I grabbed two boxes that hadn't been burned yet, put them in the back of the galley, announced I would bring them out to my cabin in an hour or two, and then went back to work. I didn't try to tell Hank what I thought of his bonfire. It had gotten to be too painful and pointless to talk to him about stuff like this. He would never admit any doubt about what he did. And the smile on his face was insulting. I did consider bringing up the matter at dinner. We virtually never had formal meetings of any sort. Sometimes real feelings would be aired at dinner time, but not often. Then I just went on doing what I was doing. There was snow on the ground. I went back to the galley. The two boxes I had put inside were outside again. Obviously, they were heading for the fire. Everything moves around around here. He shouldn't have done it. I, I went over the edge. Where's Hank? No sign of him around the fire. I started off toward the teepee. I was going to kill that bastard. I was going to break his head. I didn't matter how big he was, nor how small the straw that broke me. I'd been pushed too far. I was going to kill that bastard with my bare hands. He wasn't in the teepee. I ran up the stands and stuck my head in the cabin. Is Hank here? He wasn't. I must have been a sight. Eyes red, face muscles all distorted with passion. I couldn't find him. He and Dennis had gone for a walk somewhere. I went back to my wood chopping, and the anger drained out of me. The day wandered on. At nightfall, I went with Carol Ann to do the goats, put them in the barn, get the evening milk, and on the way back, there was a moon in the sky, we stopped in the teepee. Although I no longer felt in the least like throttling him, I felt duty-bound to let Hank know how angry I'd been at him earlier. He was sitting around the fire with Dennis and Sam and a visitor, John, Judy's old boyfriend from Montreal. He betrayed no emotion. He couldn't understand why I'd gotten so angry over beef fat. I tried to explain how he did all these things that were just designed to piss people off, but he wasn't buying it. You must be crazy, man. I don't want to make anyone angry. I just want all my brothers and sisters to be at peace with themselves and to love God, passing the hash pipe. I opened my heart to him, told him how I'd just been helpless with fury earlier in the day, told him I didn't understand it, but we, we couldn't go on this way. He shrugged it off, refused to acknowledge that anyone in the community had ever, to his knowledge, been angry at him or vice versa, mouthed some more platitudes, and casually changed the subject. I couldn't stand it. I grabbed him by the shoulders. I had to get through to this dumbass angel. I grabbed him and started shaking him. Come on, Hank, you bastard, listen to me. Something snapped. Hey, he shouted as I touched him, as if to say, you've done it now. He grabbed me by the hair and just started raining punches on my head. We rolled around for a minute. He was much stronger than me, and I soon lost interest in fighting back. I felt such intense, righteous satisfaction in having finally gotten through to this son of a bitch. It was all out in the open now. He let go of me, and we just stared hatred at each other for many seconds. My glasses lay broken on the ground somewhere. I, 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 just, I just don't understand where you're at, man. I just don't understand where you're at. Coming in here and laying this physical trip on me while I'm on my teepee on acid. 
He started hitting me again, rabbit punches all around my head and neck. I, I just let it come. We went on like that for several minutes, him stopping and trying to articulate it and then hitting me again, just unable to contain his fury. The rest of the people in the teepee protested and tried to hold us apart, finally succeeding as the impact wore off. I hadn't realized he was on acid, but I told myself it didn't matter. Hank takes acid so often and is so proud of his control. I'm so high and cool. I just sat there exhausted and frightened and hateful and self-satisfied, so relieved that that energy wasn't pent up inside anymore. We made contact. It was an awful moment, but as I walked down to the galley with my broken glasses, I, I felt great. It was a victory for me, and I felt certain things would change now for the